my mantra and my intention for this year is I want to love the way I feed myself without all the noise. Like I want to eat with joy. That's like my favorite thing. I want to eat with joy and I want to love the way I feed myself. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Seek the Joy podcast. Happy Seek the Joy Tuesday. I'm your host, Sydney Weiss, and happy unofficial, but also sometimes official start of the summer. I don't know, for some reason, I always have found or felt that Memorial Day weekend was the start of summer, but really, summer doesn't start until the summer solstice on Sunday, June 20th. And by now you probably know that I am hosting our first ever Seek the Joy summer series. It goes live on Sunday, June 20th, and you are totally invited. The sessions are so beautiful. I just finished recording all of them last week from a solstice meditation, yoga flow, and community chat sound healing, and workshops on sanctuary, tapping into the summer energy, the power of play, and stepping into our self-care. It is These sessions are just so good and powerful and nourishing. I cannot wait to share them with you. So as always, check out the show notes for the link to sign up and register for free or head on over to seekthejoypodcast.com slash seekthejoysummer. All right, but I want to dive in to today's new episode because it is also so, so good. On the podcast today is Chef Amber. She's an entrepreneur, spiritually led chef, author, and owner of two restaurants known as the Source Cafe. One is in Hermosa Beach and the other is in Manhattan Beach. And Amber is really committed to making a paradigm shift in the world through food. She's been in the restaurant business since the age of 14 And I just know you're going to love her energy and this conversation. So we dive into Amber's rock bottom moment that led to her spiritual awakening and her mission and passion to facilitate this paradigm shift through food. I just know you're going to love that part of the conversation. Amber shares her tips and tools for nourishing our mind, body, and soul and how slowing down really leads to greater self-care and why the magic is in allowing yourself to sit in the discomfort. And honestly, there has been so much discomfort in the last year. We also talk about what opening the second location of the Source Cafe in the middle of the pandemic taught Amber about staying in faith and trust as opposed to fear. Plus, Amber shares the role of nourishment in connection in food, the joy she gets from her work, her biggest dream, and so much more. So I will tell you, Mercury is now officially in retrograde and Amber and I recorded this in the pre-shadow period, which meant we had some technical difficulties. So you may hear some spotty connection moments, things may drop out, but honestly, this conversation is so good. I I just know you're going to love it. So bear with me and the technology issues as we now approach and enter Mercury retrograde. As always, I cannot wait to hear what you think about today's new episode. Make sure to join the conversation on our social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. We are at Seek the Joy Podcast everywhere. Wherever you are tuning in right now, make sure to hit subscribe or follow. And while you're there, especially if you're on Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star rating and review. Ratings and reviews really help the podcast get seen by new people and just tell them what we're all about. So make sure to take a screenshot of that five-star review and send it to sydney at seekthejoypodcast.com and I will send you something to say thank you and I just always love connecting with all of you outside of the show. All right, that's it. That is all I've got. I cannot wait to hear what you think about this one. It is such a good conversation. Chef Amber is so wonderful. And so without further ado, let's dive into this one all about how we can use holistic living to nourish our mind, body, and soul. Chef Amber, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. I know you have a really... I think phenomenal journey diving into your own spirituality and the power of food to really nourish us, you know, from the inside out. So I would love to start off by asking you, you know, where did this passion or interest or drive to use food in this way to 
heal us, to nourish us, mind, body, and soul? Where, where did that even start? Where did that come from? Okay. Well, thanks so much for having me on. I'm so excited to to talk about this today. Um, so yes, yeah, so my journey in healing myself with food came from a desperation to feel better and heal myself. Okay. I had to hit, um, and go through a rock bottom mm -hmm. and have a spiritual awakening and kind of a slap across the face from universe. God time to wake up and take care of myself. I am a chef. I've been in the restaurant business since I've been 15 years old and my life is food. I love food and my whole life. Yes. I create been in the restaurant and kitchens and creating food, but I've also abused food. So I have about three decades of, um, disordered eating and eating disorder and binging and restricting and hiding food. And finally, after three decades, I fell on my face. I was at, it was about 10 years ago and I was inflamed. I was overweight. I had brain fog. I was depressed. My body was in a tremendous amount of pain. And I was like, there's gotta be another way I've got mm -hmm. to be able to heal. You know, I don't want to just start popping pills and putting band-aids on it. And so I did end up getting a part of my rock bottom was I had two torn hip labrums. And wow. so I had one, because I was over exercising and working 80 hours a week and um, running myself in the ground. And I was pretty much overdoing everything. And so I had a hip, a hip scope, a hip surgery, and the doctors wanted to immediately do my other hip. And I said, absolutely not. So mm. I went away. And I'm, the reason I'm saying this, because this is a big part of my story of what, yeah. because I was classically trained Italian kitchen. It was my first restaurant. I was an executive chef there for 10 years. And at the end of my career there, that's when I hit my rock bottom and mm -hmm. I was in so much pain, went through the hip surgery, started to lose, lose my passion for the type of food I was cooking and started to realize, oh my God, I've been abusing food for this many years. It's time to heal myself with food. And I kept hearing a voice in my head said like, listen, you can heal yourself. You can heal yourself. So mm -hmm. I went through a spiritual awakening and started meditating and doing breath work and visualizing and studying the powers of superfood and turmeric before turmeric was hot and mm -hmm. really started visualizing what I wanted to do next. And I knew God, I use the word God, God was speaking through me. I really knew that it was time to have some sort of healthy cafe or storefront where I could use my creativity as a chef and fuse it in to this new beautiful way of, of living. And I knew that there was a passion and a drive out there, not only for me to heal myself with food, but I knew other people were eager for that. So I took that leap um, mm -hmm. nine years ago and opened up my first restaurant, The Source Cafe in Hermosa Beach. And it was a terrifying you know, risk to do, but I yeah. was determined myself with food. And I just kept saying, you know what, food is here to nourish and fuel, fuel our bodies. And that's what I did. And I've been open for nine years. And so that is a very quick kind of backstory mm -hmm. of how I got into the nourishing part of, of why I'm so passionate um, and believe that food is here to nourish our bodies. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you for sharing all that. I, I think my biggest takeaway from what you just shared is this theme that I think we all experience where you have highs and lows in life, but often it's those low moments. You've got to hit them to really learn about yourself, learn about what you need. And then I think be able to have that level of awareness to say, okay, I need to pivot or I need to do something differently. And I found, at least for me, I didn't have those moments or I didn't have that moment until I hit my version of mm -hmm. rock bottom. So I think it's so interesting to hear that, you know, very similarly with you, everything kind of had to just... Yeah, blow up in a way for you to have this reckoning with yourself of, wow, I need to change my relationship with food. And beyond that, this is like a great opportunity to learn about what I need. Yeah. Yeah. And I do love that you say that. I mean, honestly, my best golden moments in life come after I come out of a low, mm. you know, I mean, I, I I'm grateful for that rock bottom. Was it painful? Was it hard as heck? Yes. Yeah. But I'm so grateful because I, I don't think that I would have taken the the risk and the leap to leave my restaurant and make a change and really start to take care of my body and heal my relationship with food. Yeah. Mm. So as yeah. you started to embark on this, this journey for yourself, and you mentioned you had a spiritual awakening, mm -hmm. were you starting to tap into meditation, breath work? What was that like? Were you surrounding yourself with different teachers or modalities? I'm so curious what really helped you along that part of your journey. 
So definitely what helped me first was breath work. And what Mm -hmm. I did was I was introduced to a breath work teacher around that time when I had my spiritual awakening and his teacher, David Elliott has this book called healing. And I always mention this book because I opened up the book and it said, list all the ways that you love yourself. And I could barely think of a couple. And at that moment in life, I did, I wasn't in acceptance with my body. I didn't like my body. I didn't really know how to love myself. And I was like, wow, this is really wrong. So with his book and his teachings and breath work, it really started to crack me open. And I started to just, I was addicted to it. I was doing breath work at my house. Mm. I was going to breath work seminars. I was finding groups of people that were on the same journey and lots of tears and lots of pain. And I started to realize there's a lot of trauma and anxiety and stress Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. started to have through those meditations. I mean, I ended up having the courage to leave my job Um, through those meditations came my visualizations for the source cafe, my restaurant. Um, Some of my relationships changed. I let go of, and that, that was major. I started to really through breath work and also quiet meditation, learn to start to create some boundaries Mm -hmm, (laughs) and mm -hmm. let go of saying yes all the time and learning how to say no. I I learned how to say no about 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And visual and visualization. Like I started to visualize exactly what I wanted my life to be. How do I want to feel in my body? What do I want my new cafe to look like? Um, all of it. Like, what do Mm -hmm. I want to manifest? Yeah. Yeah. I think part of it, it just sounds like you allowed yourself to slow down. Like you allowed yourself to take a literal breath for the first time in a long time. And you mentioned this at the beginning of our conversation that you were a classically trained chef. I think you said in an Italian restaurant and you had been doing this for over a decade. And so I can imagine, you know, this process of even allowing yourself to slow down. What was that like? Cause when I have to force myself to slow down, there's a lot of resistance. I'm like, yeah. really? I can't go do this. I can't move. I can't. It's hard, especially if you're hard. such a go-getter and you're type A. So what was that like for you to just really force or allow yourself to slow down in a way that you probably weren't used to? I think it's the most uncomfortable thing as you totally yep. relate. As you just said, yep. it's so uncomfortable. And I have friends that are so chill and they're like, not like that at all. They ha- they don't have a problem slowing down at all. And for me, <laughs> it was like so uncomfortable, but I think um, finally learning how to be and not do all the time and breathing into it. And, and honestly, I really feel like it was a form of learning self-care that I deserve to slow down, that I deserved to give myself time. Um, that was hard because I always was putting other people first. So it was very uncomfortable. And I won't lie to this day, I still catch myself going back. It's easy to fall back into the overdoing and the people pleasing. And I'm like, wait, Amber, no. So I, on my calendar today, mark off X's of I'm going to do nothing. And I'm telling you, it's still hard. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm putting out three books. I've got three restaurants. I mean, yeah, I've got four. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a second. No, 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 Amber, you can just sit in the backyard under the tree and stare at the sky. Mm-hmm. You don't have to ch- check emails or Instagram. No, you <laughs> can just be, you can let yourself just be. And it's really uncomfortable, but I think once we allow it, it feels so yummy. And then mm-hmm. our my body started to really heal when I started to take that time because mm-hmm. I was also suffering from adrenal fatigue. And honestly, I didn't even have the energy to go, go, go hundred miles an hour. Yeah. So I was kind of physically forced to, to slap on my butt. And I mean, I think my body and God, they, you know, when I'm not listening, it's, um, I get a big wake up call and something mm-hmm. has to happen where I'm like literally forced to sit on my butt. Yeah. 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 I've had that moment too. Um, for me, it was almost God, what year are we? We're in 2021. So it was like five years ago and I had shingles and appendicitis all within the period of three uh-huh. months after graduating from law school and then not passing the bar exam. And it was like, I needed that big bang, you know, for me to kind of wake up and realize, whoa, you need to take better care of yourself. You need to find a new way to define your worth in this world. It's not through how productive you are. And it really took like that big moment. But I noticed too, along the way, there were all these little signs or these little symbols or messages from the universe or God, however you resonate with it, that was telling me to slow down, but I wasn't getting it. So I needed the big bang. Have you had like little moments too, that would lead up to the big one? Yeah. Oh, and you know what? I'm such a, um, I have amnesia. Like I'll like forget. I know, (laughs) I mean, I know when I'm running and I'll feel fatigued and I see the signs. I'm like, Ooh, I just push it. I can do it. I'm going to pretend I don't see it. If I don't see it, it doesn't exist. 
oh no, it's okay. You know, my lower back will start to hurt. I'll start to be fatigued in the morning. I can't get up or I'll start to crave sugar or coffee. Mm -hmm. And then you know what? Universe has to slap me on my butt. I have to learn the hard way. And that's when I'm like, okay, I hear you body. And our body never lies. Our body is always going to tell us, you know, people will always come to me in my restaurants that I coach and stuff. And they'll say, well, I'm bloated or I'm having, I'm constipated. I have diarrhea, I have eczema. It's like, that your body's trying to tell you something, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> our body is, you know, or, or I'm in like severe pain. Like it, it, our, we have to listen to our body. And it, yeah. that took me until I was in my thirties to really, really like stop ignoring those signs. And I would put band-aids on it with caffeine or sugar, yeah. Or alcohol. Yeah. I think we all do that, you know, in some yeah. form, we all find band-aids or we all, you know, pretend that we don't see the sign or we don't or we act like we don't experience the fatigue or the soreness or the achiness or the eczema or whatever might pop up in our body. And, you know, I'm curious, you know, I know a big part of your work and, and with the Source Cafe and your own personal life as well is really about the power of food and then how it can nourish us and nutrition to really um, take care of ourselves. And so as you embarked on this journey to really see food as a medicine, which I think is so beautiful. And there's been such a shift, I think, in the last few years of our ability to see food in this way. What was that like for you? I mean, was it a big adjustment? Did you feel comfortable, you know, starting to maybe incorporate herbs or different things and see food in this way? What was like for you to kind of shift your perspective um, around food? You know what? It was baby steps for me. And then all of a sudden it clicked. I started to feel like, for instance, I started with turmeric for my inflammation and started to be like, whoa, I'm actually feeling, I'm feeling better. Mm -hmm. Or I was trying to heal my gut. So I started to cut out gluten and I was like, oh my God, my acne is gone. You know, all these little things. And then all of a sudden I went head first in and I started eating medicinal, excuse me, medicinal mushrooms and chlorella and my skin was glowing. And I was, I cut out dairy and gluten and sugar and really started to realize like, whoa, like we can heal our bodies with food. Food is medicine. And I don't want to walk around bloated, gassy, fatigued, right. And inflamed. And honestly, People that don't realize how bad they feel. I mean, I don't think most Americans walk around feeling pretty poor because they've never, they don't know what it's like to feel good. And Mm -hmm. that was me. Um, And that's not passing judgment at all. That's, that's just how it is. And so when I finally got a taste of, whoa, this is feeling good and I'm starting to heal my body, that's, I, I couldn't stop. And I went like head first in and I, um, I, yeah, I mean, my passion is to make a paradigm shift in the world through food and really Mm -hmm. show people that what we put in our bodies matters right now. You know, I mean, it's so easy in our twenties and even a little bit in our thirties, we're going to eat and drink whatever the heck we want. But a lot of people that I coach and see in my restaurants are hitting 50 and they're like, Whoa, I can't eat and drink like this anymore. And, um, you know, people are on more medicine and there's more diabetes and Mm -hmm. there's more inflammation. So it's, it's, it's really important. And we feel so much better. I mean, it's so amazing to feel aligned and confident and strong in our bodies. I mean, my mantra and my intention for this year is I want to love the way I feed myself Mm. without all the noise. Like I want to eat with joy. That's like my favorite thing. I want to eat with joy and I want to love the way I feed myself without like, Oh my God, it's going to make me fat. That has too many calories. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I love this. I want to eat with joy. Right. Isn't that the best? It is the best. That is the best because, you know, often when we think about eating healthy and I don't think this is true, but I think this is how a lot of people think when we think about, or we talk about eating healthy, we think about the food doesn't taste good. It's, it's lacks flavor. It's not exciting. It's plain, it's boring, but I know that's not the case with what you're doing with the source cafe. So can we talk a little bit about that? Because I think we all want to eat with joy and we want to eat healthy with joy. So what is that like for you? love that you said that because one of my passions is trying to get rid of this stigma around the word healthy. Okay. Mm -hmm. People think that healthy food is steamed broccoli with plain chicken and tofu, right? Boring. Boring (laughs) y'all. No, like my life is food. Food to me is so beautiful. My Southern Italian training, I take that passion and that the integrity for that and simplicity of that food. And I fuse it in and my restaurant is gluten-free, dairy-free. I use three oils in house. I use coconut, olive oil, avocado. We fry in all of our coconut oil, or I'm sorry, avocado oil. And I really want to say that sexy is the new healthy because mm. I sexy is one of my favorite words to describe food. I mean, when you have a beautiful plate of ripe red succulent tomatoes, 
that are juicy. All you need is a little sea salt and extra virgin olive oil. That is a sexy dish. And so my food, you're, I can take meat and potato eaters and bring them in and they, they're so sat satisfied. I mean, I have biscuits, I have paleo buns. I have this, we hand roll our own pasta. Hmm. I have, you know, with salsa verde and, you know, it's just, it's really, um, yeah, healthy food is not boring, y'all. I have mm -hmm. a cookbook coming out and like showing that like also eating vegetables doesn't have to be boring um, because food is here to be enjoyed. And I never want to feel deprived. I mean, th this is my life. I mean, I need food to be sexy and fun. I need to have excitement mm -hmm. and to be able to eat with joy is it's every time I sit down to a meal, I'm like, you know what? This is, this is my intention with mm -hmm. this meal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. I can't even tell you because as someone who is gluten-free, dairy-free, grain-free, and sugar-free and not by choice, but for health, mm -hmm. I am constantly running into, oh my God, this food is so boring. Oh my God, how can I get more flavor? How can I feel joy around food? So I love yeah. your focus and your, your mission and this whole paradigm shift of, hey, what you nourish yourself with can be fun and joyful and you can actually enjoy yeah. what you're eating. It doesn't have to feel so laborious. And I yeah. think it's also about like removing so, so much of the stigma that's associated with yeah. the word healthy, which I feel kind of silly saying the word, like there's a stigma, but I think you're right. Like we think it's boring. We think it's all about losing weight. No, it's about nourishing yourself yeah. in a way that will make you feel good in your body yeah. and in your skin. Yes, you get it. Yes, in your body and in your skin, really feeling embodied and confident. Because think about it, when we're walking around eating processed food and junk food, right? Mm -hmm. And you're feeling, you have brain fog, you don't have energy, people's libido is down. But really when we're nourishing our bodies, I believe that nourishment is holistic. I believe that health and nourishment is not just about the food we eat, but it starts with the food. So mm -hmm. for me, I'm nourishing my body, I'm sleeping well, I have proper elimination, I'm managing my stress levels, how's my spiritual practice, right? Am I meditating? I do transcendental meditation now. So I meditate twice a day. Mm. Am I getting outside? Am I putting my feet in mother earth? You know, do I have community? Am I grateful? Like it's all encompassing for me. Yeah. And that is how I view nourishment, but it starts with me always with food because then from that place, I can like really take those small little commitments to continue. Yeah. So. And to me, it makes so much sense that it starts with food because it's such a beautiful domino effect. If you are nourishing yeah. yourself in a way that makes you feel good, then you will sleep better. Then yeah. you, you know, um, won't be constipated. Like you yeah. will feel better. You'll have more energy. So I love this beautiful domino effect. And I love that you said too, that it's holistic, that it is about mind, body, and soul. When you're nourishing yourself with food, it's not just about your body. It's about how you start to feel mentally and how you start to feel on the soul level, spiritually, yeah. and when you're speaking and being, you know, from that heart space too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's so good. It is such mind, body, soul connection. It's, it's, it's everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So we've talked about how you, it sounds like you nourish your body through food that really brings you a lot of joy. How are you continuing to nourish your, your mind and your soul? I think, especially, you know, in the last year yeah. where it's been, it's tough. And I know you opened your second location in the middle of the pandemic. So I'll ask you about that in a second, but how are you continuing to nourish your mind and, and nourish your soul, you know, during this time as well? Yes. So that's a great question. So I, my spiritual practice is the most important thing in my life. Mm -hmm. And I, I did share earlier about breath work. I transitioned into transcendental meditation about three and a half years ago, which completely changed my life. It's two um, times a day, 22 minute meditations. And I stuck my nose up at it. I was like, oh, I could never do that. I don't have time for that. But how, how I take care of myself now is it is my non-negotiable. I don't care if I have to pull over on the side of the road, I'm doing my second meditation. So meditation helped me through this last year, especially with COVID and stress and keeping me in faith and not letting me go into fear. Mm -hmm. I also, um, I have some spiritual, I think it's really important for community. So I have a, a healer and a coach that I work with. I don't believe that we do life alone. I'm a big fan of therapists, mentors, um, whatever your word is, people stick their nose up at therapy. I've had therapy my whole life. I'm, I have an intuitive therapist and I work with a, a spiritual coach. And mm -hmm. so I surround myself with those people to keep myself tethered. And I also am on a zoom call once a week with like-minded souls where we get to talk about spirituality and we got to, to, to share what the challenges are to keep my mind, to keep my mind strong, but keep my, my soul connected and remember, and I still do breath work. So like, I'm actually doing a breath work class tonight, mm -hmm. which I'm really excited about. Um, 
you know, and taking quiet days, taking the, um, it's, e it's actually, believe it or not, been easier this last year to sit down and remember to sit underneath my tree and, and journal and have some gratitude and stay optimistic and in faith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm really struck by what you said that for you, it's been about staying in faith and staying in a space of trust as opposed to staying in a space of fear. Yeah. I think that has been the number one challenge, like above anything else is staying in this space of trust, knowing, and faith. And I think confidence in yourself and what's happening around you when yeah. it's so chaotic and not dropping into this fear. And I love the practices that you've shared that you really tap into, you know, that allow you to do that. And I think this is why I love doing this podcast, because we get to talk about what is keeping us anchored, what yeah. is keeping us in that space of trust and faith, which ultimately allows us to seek our joy, experience our joy and allow ourselves to do so. Because exactly. over the last year, my God, there, and there oh. continues to be fear. Yeah, there is. It's, there's, there's so much fear around this. And last year I opened up my second restaurant in Manhattan beach. And seriously, I mean, talk about <laughs> making, like keeping myself and I mean, opening up a restaurant in regular times is extremely hard. Opening yeah. up a restaurant in COVID when the whole world is ending and I close my Hermosa store twice. And I was trying to open Manhattan and to keep myself angered without going to sugar and binging and emotional eating and alcohol and caffeine and all of my drugs of choice that were my past. Yeah. Um, meditation, meditation, meditation. And I've always been told people are always like, you're so optimistic. Like it's so annoying. And it's like, I have two <laughs> choices y'all. These are my, mm -hmm. this is how I find it. I either can live in fear. And with that, first of all, you probably would never be able to work, be around me. I would be drinking vodka and eating dozens of cookies and burying my head in the sand and be a complete mm -hmm. mess. So that's one option. And my second option is to stay completely in faith. I believe you can only choose faith or fear at the same time and keep optimistic and know that God is in the details. And you know what? I'm going to be okay. I, mm -hmm. I'm going to, and I just would tell myself, everything's going to be okay. My staff is going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. God's got me. Talk about the prayer. I mean, I get down on my knees and pray, pray and visualize, but I always knew in my heart that I was going to be okay. And I was surrounded by partners and employees that were terrified. And I just, you know what, I'm keeping, I'm going to keep the anchor here. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't go into, and sure. Did the fear come up? Absolutely. I'm human. And it's a yeah. sneaky little bit. It comes in really fast. And then I would think, oh my God, my restaurants are going to close and my employees and and I pull myself back, right? Yeah, but I have yeah. the spiritual practices and the tools, thank God, to be able to pull me in. Or like I said, I would have been at, you know, burying my head in the sand mm -hmm. with a bottle of vodka. <laughs> mm -hmm. I get it. I get it. I mean, I keep telling myself if I didn't have this podcast, the conversations and the community yeah. as my anchor, you know, have it's not my full anchor, but it's definitely one of the anchors on my ship, you know, to allow myself to, to maintain whatever sense of sanity, you know, that I needed. And I think too, you know, I'm, what I'm getting from what you just shared is you had to allow yourself to sit in the discomfort oh, yeah. and know that it would be okay. Even if you don't know how, but you just yeah. knew you had to keep telling yourself it was going to be okay. That yeah. process of allowing ourselves to sit in discomfort, whether Ooh. it's in the middle of a global pandemic, or you yeah. just don't know what's coming next. I mean, talk about really just having trust with yourself. It is hard. It, it is so hard. Is hard. And I mean, the reason I ate for or starved myself for three decades, because I didn't want to sit in the discomfort. Mm. So my book, I actually have two books coming out. My first book coming out is called hungry. Why I effing eat. Mm -hmm. And it, um, about my relationship with food and how I binge and restrict and starved myself. But it talks about how I never wanted to sit in the discomfort. I always ran from it. And I didn't really want to look at the why of why I'm feeling discomfort, right? Um, mm -hmm. I never trusted that I was going to be okay. So I just ate or I would starve myself, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And now it's really the, really the gold is sitting in this discomfort without going to act out and knowing maybe that I need a nap or I need some water. Or I need to take a walk or I need to call a friend or, you know, what, what do I need right now? Maybe I need to take the day off. Like that's instead of going and grabbing that thing, that's going to basically you know, numb ourselves. So we don't have to sit, sit in the pain because mm -hmm. it will pass. It always passes. It never seems like it. And when no. it passes, there's usually light, um, and calm and, and, and sanity. <laughs> Always. It's just a matter of when, like, when That's will it right. show up? Yeah. You know, yeah. like yeah. I know, it, I know the relief will come, it really but it's like, when, how yeah. do I, you know, how long do I sit in this? You know, something that you said too, is you, 
reverted to, you know, not eating or overeating because you didn't want to experience that level of discomfort. And I'm curious now, as you allow yourself to experience that discomfort and tap into your tools and your resources, how, I don't really know what what I'm trying to ask you, but I guess I'm curious, how has that felt for you? Have you felt liberated? Do you feel resistance? Like, what is that experience like for you either um, emotionally or in the body? Because I think we talk a lot about how we're either able to do one or the other, but not how maybe we feel in that moment of experiencing it. Ooh, I love this question. So for me, it took me a minute to sit in it without, you know, squirming. Squirming. Mm-hmm. squirming. It's like, ooh, this is so uncomfortable. I hate this. I do not want to be in my body right now. Yeah. Now I always feel that like anxiety and I breathe through that anxiety and I know that's moving out from my heart. And I, it now, once I sit in it, and this is how I explain it in my book, I try to detach from it. I don't attach to it. And I try to detach and observe it mm-hmm. and accept it and lean into it. The more I try to squirm out of it, the harder my lows are. And it's basically going to suck me in. If I can detach, I'm like, oh, interesting. I'm in it right now. Ooh, this is really, really uncomfortable. Mm, okay. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to just breathe into it. And honestly, it builds so much inner self-esteem and inner mm. confidence when I'm not like, screw it. I'm going to go get that cookie. I'm going to go get that tequila. I'm going to go get that coffee. I'm going to go oh, spend money, right? right <laughs> Internet right. Show, anything to to, um, I'm going to go overwork and just bury myself in work. Cause I don't want to, de- I don't want to sit in it. So it really, for me builds so much confidence, um, in allowing in those moments of low for me to feel my feelings and maybe I need a good cry and I never used to allow myself to do it. And mm-hmm. that brings a heart opening, um, in the low, which feels really yummy. Hmm. It's about being the observer, noticing what you're experiencing yeah. and not putting any judgment on yourself or the experience. Because the moment we start judging ourselves, oh my God, why do you feel this way? You shouldn't feel this way. It heightens it and it heightens it for you. So the power of being an observer of your own emotions and your own experience. Beautiful. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. It's powerful. It takes practice to get there. Whoever's listening, like, but once you can tap in and be the observer, it's profound. Mm -hmm. And it Mm -hmm. really, once you're on the other side of it, you feel so strong. Yeah. (laughs) I can imagine. Yeah. I freaking, you know what I mean? Like, I love that. You know, also I'm curious in, you talked about how it allowed you to build confidence or inner strength or inner trust with yourself. In, in doing that and building that up for yourself, I imagine you also had to redefine some things for yourself in your life. So either redefine what it means to be productive or redefine what it means to be successful or to show up for yourself um, in a way that is meaningful and profound for you. So did you have to redefine anything or, or change some of that for yourself? Because I know for me, for example, I really had to redefine success and no longer attach my self-worth to what, you know, we as a society deem as successful or being productive. And the minute I did that, it was like this big, like light bulb over the right side of my head. And I felt so liberated and like, no, I don't need to define myself in that way. I'm curious if you had moments like that too. Yeah. So I, I definitely relate. So my over productivity and the mm-hmm. overdoing and the kind of the martyr energy that I mm-hmm. have, um, that was a big, big thing for me. I mean, I am the CEO of three businesses, right? Yeah. I've got, I've got a lot of people that work for me and my coach kept saying, you need to delegate more. So I finally to help me read and stop being the martyr. Oh, I feel so guilty. I need to go in and do this. And that was really hard, but I really had to redefine that because I did look at success for the first, I don't know, 15 years of my life is how hard that bad. I think Brene Brown says it's that badge of that badge we wear of how hard Mm -hmm. we work. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, Oh yeah. Like, look at how great I am. I worked 80 hours this week. It's like, that's not great at all. So now it's like, oh, you know what? I don't feel guilty when I have a four day work week. Like that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, That was really hard for me Um, and not feeling guilty around it and really knowing that like, well, I can have a six hour work day. It doesn't have to be 10 or 12. Um, And putting, and I think too, of redefining me is what I really had to do is like I shared before is learning to say no. Um, that, that was, that goes hand in hand, um, and delegate. So I would Mm -hmm. say no. And then 
and trust and say, you know what, before my control issues of, I would delegate something, but I still was micromanaging and I wasn't very much, um, well, I didn't have very much trust that they were going to actually fulfill or do what I asked them to, because I thought mm -hmm. I could do it better. Mm -hmm. So now I turn it over. If there's a problem, we'll deal with it later. And that, that, that's, that's was huge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that element of trust is so huge. Yeah. I'm curious to you about the role of nourishment in connection and how food plays a role in our ability to connect with one another. I had a really beautiful conversation earlier this year with um, Lindsay Gardner. She wrote this book called Why We Cook, and she interviewed all these different women uh, in the culinary world from restaurateurs to chefs to home cooks. And we talked a lot about like the power of food to connect us. So I'm curious, you know, in your journey and your experience as a chef and with the Source Cafe and everything that you're doing, how has food, you know, allowed you to connect with others or bring in that sense of nourishment from connection? Yeah, I think that um, connection and community is a big part of our nourishment. It's mm -hmm. a huge, it's a huge part of our nourishment, the holistic nourishment. And I think that one reason I'm addicted to the restaurant business is because I get to create this community. And when I opened up the restaurant and um, Hermosa nine years ago, it it was slowly building, and now to this day, it is. There was a major community in Hermosa to open it up in Manhattan is because now you cook a meal for somebody, especially if it's my friends and I get to go out and sit down and I serve and food brings I mean, everyone loves great food. I mean, food brings people together and especially people that are coming in and they're so that and I haven't been out to eat in a year. And for me to be able to cook a meal, a memorable meal for that person and connect with a stranger over that, it's, it feel that keeps me going in this hard industry, especially if it's a child that's never had a chip cookie before, or mm -hmm. a pizza, a fried chicken sandwich, and now I can do it with integrity that, and now the mom's texting me and emailing me and, oh, I'm going to bring my friends. And it just creates, I just got the chills because I started cooking at a young age my grandpa wanted to do was cook in the kitchen. And then and we would talk coffee. And as I got older, there was always people around me in the kitchen. And it, it brings a sense of, I mean, when I go home, it's in the kitchen talking to my family and people are having coffee or wine. And I don't know, it's, it is the best. It is so nourishing for my soul. So important. Hmm. I love all that. Thank it's, you. Thank you for sharing all that. I think it's really powerful, the role of food to connect us and also bring, you know, up those different memories that we had, especially growing up or, or as kids. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing all of that. I think it's safe to say you get joy from what you do and the connections you're able to make and, and the work that you're able to do. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm grateful every day. My work doesn't feel like work. Like I get excited to go to work. I'm blessed that my work brings me joy. And this is, you know, I've so enjoyed this conversation with you and I would love to ask you, you know, the question I ask everybody that comes on the podcast and, uh, that is, what is your biggest dream? Oh my, my gosh, my biggest dream. Oh, I want to make the biggest impact, um, inspiring people to love the way they feed themselves. And that with that, I really, my dream is to have a healthy cooking show <laughs> on a, a national cooking show to be able to reach as many people and really help not only people love a um, healthy relationship with food. Hmm. I love that. I'm excited for that TV show. When it airs, I will definitely be tuned in. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Chef Amber, I have loved having this conversation with you and just really exploring how we can use food to nourish our mind, body, and soul. So where can everybody find you, connect, and uh, learn more? And, and what are your cookbooks coming out? Okay, so, so I am Amber LA, and my website is chefamber.com, and I've got a blog, and, and a ton of beautiful, sexy recipes. And then I have two books coming out. I have... Um, Hungry, why I effing eat. That will be out August 2nd about my relationship with food, how to have a healthy relationship with food. And then my cookbook will be out in October and that's called Sexy Nourishing Food to Fuel Your Mind, Body, and Soul. Follow me on um, Instagram. And then 
if you're in the south, if you're in the South Bay, you can come visit me at either the um, uh, or Manhattan at the Source Cafe. Yeah. Perfect. Everything's going to go in the show notes. We'll make it so easy for everyone to connect with you. And thank you again. Okay. This was so much fun to sit down with you. Internet issues and, and all. Well, so thank you. Fun. I know. It was awesome. Thank you. I could talk for hours with you. Thank you. Oh, same. <laughs> same. Okay. I'm going to.